Buenos dias, good morning. I'm your host, Carolina Moreno, and welcome to Build. Cristela Alonso is a groundbreaking comedian and actor. She was the first Latina to create, produce, and star in her own sitcom, Cristela, uh, in 2014. And this week, she's releasing her memoir, Music to My Years, a mixtape memoir of growing up and standing up. Please give a warm welcome to Cristela Alonso. Hello, hello, everybody. That's my face. <laughs> And that's the mem that's the cover for your memoir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's amazing. So um, I just really want to commend you for really, it's hard to put pen to paper to tell your story at all. Dude, it was really hard and I lived it. <laughs> like, like I was writing it and I'm like, and you know, like what you don't think, I don't know. Do you think your life is exciting? Um, when I look back, sometimes I'm like, wow, I've come a pretty good yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. So like, I think that, and then I was writing it down, and I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I, like, glamorized my life in my mind, because then you write it, and you're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, I think I'm kind of boring, and then I'm like, oh, but I'm not, because then I remember something good, right? Yeah, you know? and, the, and it also kind of makes it feel, when I, when I look back at my life, I'm like, it feels like I've lived many different lives. Like a, a whole, I'm a oh, whole different totally. person to than I was. My life, it's like I stole everybody's identity, like eight people's <laughs> identity, because it, it, like I went through evolutions and stuff. And it's really interesting when you look back and you're like, I went through this phase, I went through this phase, I went through this phase. And then the older you get, you realize that you're actually a combination of all those versions, you yeah. know? Like it's kind of like the greatest hits yeah. of that phase that you, that's how you become. That's how you, that's what you end up being. Like, I really like my hair on this camera, right? <laughs> like, Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, so no, but it, seriously, and you, and you really open up. This book is, first of all, congratulations, you, no ghostwriting, right? You wrote- Oh, you, no, no, no. You wrote this you book. You know what's yourself. funny? People were surprised that I wanted to write my book. Uh, Why? Because, because, because everybody, like, they're so used to the ghostwriting that they thought I wanted someone else to do it. And I'm like, <laughs> no. But like, but like I said, I wanted to write a book. It's like, why wouldn't I write my book? You know? No, I, every word, I loved it. I mean, like, I love the experience. I can't, it still hasn't hit me that I actually wrote a book. It's right here. It's I, proof. Right in your hand. I'm, it's in my hand. It's like in your hand. And you, you really open, <laughs> it's in my hand. It's in your hand. It's in my hand. Yeah, it's oh my in God. your hand. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, no, but you really, <laughs> you really, and like, obviously you're a comedian, and I think that there, there's some points in the book where you're like, right, I'm a comedian, but this isn't necessarily a funny story. Yeah. There, there's some real big things. You really delve deep, you know, from your life growing up in the south, south, south of Texas. Super south. Super yeah. south of Texas. Um, you know, your family, uh, you know, essentially squatting yes. at, in a diner, an abandoned diner, what, you know, that life was with your mom and your siblings and all the way to the loss of your mom, all the way to Cristela and the sitcom with ABC. Yeah. What was it like sort of retracing those steps with the highs and the lows? Uh, the lows really hurt, actually. The book took me a long time to write because the, the lows made you relive everything again, mm. over and over again. And even when you wrote it, you still, I didn't realize, look, I didn't realize the process of the book. So I didn't realize that once you turn it in, you have to edit your book yeah. multiple times. So you have to read it over and over again. So that was really hard because you read through it and you're like, oh, th this was very painful. Yeah. And it actually made me sad when I was reading it at times. But then I thought at the same point, that means that I kind of did the job of telling what I was really feeling. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and the highs... I always think that my family's very funny. I always think that my brothers are funnier than me. Hmm. You know what I mean? So like when I remember the highs, I realize that my family's been with me at the highest points a lot of times. You know, mm -hmm. like the, the best memories of my life usually involve my family being really poor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that thing where people like, when they find out how I grew up, because I did, I grew up well below the poverty line. You know, they're like, how was it? And I'm like, it was pretty happy actually you know it's it was my life you know you you only know your life you have I loved nothing it. to compare it to exactly yeah. totally until you get older and you're like oh oh that, that's how <laughs> i found out i was uh, oh. <laughs> that's how i found out i was a squatter like i didn't know that my family had squatted for the first like seven years of my life until i was like 20 21 and i was talking about my life to a friend about how i grew up we were having breakfast it was like a, a table of friends and I was telling them how I grew up and they told me that 
I was squatting. Like they told me that, that yeah. my house wasn't a house. Yeah, you were. I think you were at a diner. Uh, well, an abandoned you diner. At, you were at a diner, sort of being like, "Well, my house looks yes. kind of like this." Yeah. Like this. And he's yes, and I, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, and there was a countertop and appliances, and you know, it, we lived in a, an old business that didn't work anymore." But when I was a kid, I thought all kids grew up in yeah. that environment. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it wasn't until I was older that I'm like, oh, uh, damn, like, I was hella poor. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, damn, like, so what? So that, yeah, something it's like that felt movie, different. It's like that movie, like that moment at the end of a Scooby-Doo car, Scooby <laughs> cartoon where you find out who the bad guy is. And I was like, whoa, it's the owner of the amusement park. <laughs> like, that's how I found out. At that moment, I'm like, oh, damn, I was like super hella poor. <laughs> like, I was the poor of the poor, you know? Well, and, yeah. and, and but I really love the concept of this book because it speaks to that experience you had growing up and sort of being um, accompanied and, and finding solace in music and TV. Yes. Um, and the concept for, for everybody who doesn't know of the book is really every chapter has a different song, sort of yes. that kind of, and you mentioned sort of like playing that song over and over again to sort of get you back into the mindset and yes. bring you back to that specific time in your life. Yeah, well, you know, it's even when I was like... Uh, like, spoiler alert, like, I'm Latina. Oh my God, what? I didn't want you guys to find out this way, but I figured it's Hispanic Heritage Month, so I felt comfortable coming out. Yeah. Only this month after. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I, you know, back October into, 15th, I'm, I'm back to being white. Back into But heaven. right now, I'm Latina. And I wanted to find a way to write my book where um, it wasn't going to be a super Latino, like, project. Okay. Meaning that I can tell my story. I know that I'm Latina. I know that I grew up first generation, Mexican American, everything. But that's not the, all there is to me, mm -hmm. you know? And I think we live in this really weird time where um, culturally, politically, it's a very heightened time for the Latino community. And I feel like we don't have enough representation when it comes to uh, news media, mm -hmm. where we actually get to see Latinos as people. Mm -hmm. And Latinos as people meaning that, uh, you know, my, my brother, he became a citizen, a naturalized citizen after 30 years of trying. And it's that thing where, A, it took over 30 years because that's the process, you know, blah, blah. And I told him, I went to the naturalization ceremony and I asked him, like, what is it? feel like to be American and he said I've always been American it took this country years to figure that out mm. you know and then he talks about how he was undocumented for a bit and he always says they always like to paint us in a very dramatic light you know it's this thing where we're always sad but I also like to laugh and it's this thing that even for me I mean I was born in Texas at the same time though like I wanted people to see me as a person as a real person so that's why I picked the music. Yeah. Because the music, that equalizes everybody. Like, I, we can both like, we can both like, you know, bad example, but that's why it works. We can both like, like, um, Naughty by Nature's OPP, mm -hmm. right? You might like it because you dated a guy that, like, reminds you of that song that you're like, oh my God, you know, whatever. How did you know? Yeah, I know, you know <laughs> he told me. He, we're Facebook friends. Wow. No, but it's, you know, so, and then, but then I can like the same song for another reason yeah. where, you know, it was this, you know, where one night I just had a hell of a night with my friend, you know, like back in like, you know, when I was in school. Same song, different emotions, but that song really speaks to us, you know? Mm -hmm. So this book, I started thinking about it. I'm like, I had the sitcom where I didn't have control and I had to succumb to what networks and studios thought I was. Mm -hmm. Now, how am I supposed to tell them that, yeah, I come from a Mexican family, but I'm also American. Why do I have to remind people that I'm American? Why do I have to tell people that I like certain shows that I like certain, you know, it's like, and then when I tell them people, some people get shocked. They're like, oh, you're into da da da. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm a human being. So for me, the whole project was to find a way to tell my story where maybe people didn't have to necessarily say, oh, well, that's the Latina perspective. Cause that's how we ruin, that's how we help ruin it too. Because you know, when people say that's a Latino story, that's a Latina story, then, you actually generalize all Latinos. Yeah. And you make it seem like I'm representing everybody. Which, I can't. 
which you don't do on the on the flip side, right? Like this is a non Latino American white story. I, yeah, it, like for me, it's just like, hey, like, hey, I'm, I'm just me, you know. It, that's what happened with my show. People wanted they they build it as a Latino show, mm -hmm. and for me, I'm like, but I don't know what Cubans are like. I don't know what Puerto Ricans are like. It's like, and they all put us under the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm like yo, we're different, why can't we be individuals? So the music was like my way of saying, this is how I am just like you, even though we might not look the same. Yeah, and there, and, and it's quite the mixtape. You have li like Lionel Richie, you have Boston, you have Selena Quintanilla, Yeah, and you have uh, Ricky Martin, you have Billy Joel, you have Eminem. I will say there was one group that was missing for me, and I think you know what I'm gonna Which say. Which one? Because I don't know if you remember, but we had an interview in 2016, and you were tell you told me about this recurring dream you used to have. Yes, the new kids on the block. New kids on the block. Yes, I had this recurring dream. My dream. <laughs> so I had this recurring dream. I wanted. To, I was a diehard new kids on the block fan, and I wanted to meet them. And this is the confusing part. A boy band, they'll do like a love song, and in the video, it's five dudes singing to one chick, and I'm like. Who gets the girl? Like, who gets the girl? Like, out of the five, like, do you guys take turns dating? Like, I don't understand, right? So when I was a kid, I had this dream where I would meet the new kids on the block. And like, no kidding, my dream was I was hired to be their maid on their tour bus. And then they would see that I cleaned so well that they liked me. <laughs> now you're laughing <laughs> in the background. <laughs> and it was a... A really cool dream in my mind until years later, I'm like, bitch, why did you make yourself the maid? Like, you know what I mean? Like, like that, and that's, that was the problem. Like, like, for me, I was like, why was I the maid in my own dream? Like, I couldn't even make myself something, like, cooler in my, in my mind. I'm like, man, I'm going to be the best maid that they're going to fall in love with me. They're going to be like, how did you make that bed? And I'm like, it's a talent. Like, you know what I mean? It was so weird. But, but no, I didn't, I didn't do New Kids on the Block because at that point, I thought people expected it <laughs> oh, okay. and I did, you know, and it was like, and you know, it was just something I'm, I wanted to show people what other stuff I liked. Got it. Obviously. But I do want to, I mean, going back to your book, I want to read your dedication because I think it's really beautiful. Yes. Um, so this book is dedicated to the people who have worked in the fields, picking the food we eat, the people who clean houses, take care of children and work in restaurants to every person who has worked in a job that sometimes makes them feel invisible. I want you to know that not only do I see you, but I am a child who comes from someone just like you. People like me get to live out their dreams because of people like you who have sacrificed their own dreams in order to let their future generations have a chance at life. Gracias. Thank you. So that's beautiful. I'm a first-generation American. And my mom is an immigrant, single mother. And uh -huh. I think that it's something that we often see, right? That, that sense of like erasure of those narratives in, yeah. in the American narrative. So, and you were just talking about earlier, like this is a special time where it feels like immigrants are being dehumanized left and right. So yeah. was that the, fa was that like a main, a good, like a big factor in why you decided to write this memoir now? Yeah, you know, uh, even you reading it really, really affects me because um, I've been very lucky to have the life that I have. And it was because my mom just decided to come here for a chance and she didn't even know what that chance was. And I always tell people that um, she wanted to come to this country to have running water and to have electricity. And it's things that we take for granted a lot of times. So the fact that I get to do everything that I've been able to do is because of her. And I feel like uh, people like my mom are so constantly looked over and forgotten about that uh, that's one of the reasons I always talk about my story because I want people to know how common it is to have amazing parents. And uh, I wanted to write this book right now because I'm very proud of what my brothers and my sister and I have been able to do. My brothers, you know, they're school teachers in the hometown we grew up in. And they are, they're so grateful for the community we were raised in that they stayed there to give back to the community that gave us an education. Like, we're, you know, it, we're all good people that have done good things. And I think that when you get those people 
we don't give enough thought to how did they become good people. And uh, it's funny because we always celebrate dreams, but I feel like we don't celebrate the journey mm -hmm. to get to the dreams because the journey actually includes a lot of people that go unnoticed. So when I was dedicating the book, I realized that uh, I always end up becoming friends with everybody in the neighborhood. Like that reminds me of my mom, mm -hmm. you know, and it could be the guy selling fruit. It could be like when I stay at a hotel, like the like housekeeping like hooks it up, you know what I mean, for me. And, every, and it's like, it just reminds me of my family because that's who I am. And my thank you is just to remind everybody that uh, people like that exist. And not only do they exist, but we need to, for, to remember that they're loved by people. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, a big reason why a lot of people are able to do what they do. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we're both first generation Americans. And for anybody who doesn't know, it just means that you're either the first generation in your family to be born or raised in, in the United States. And I was raised here. I was born in Colombia. Um, but it's an interesting space to inhabit identity wise because you are kind of feeling a little bit not stuck, but like in between two spaces, right? And like, you also have to teach your family. I don't know about you, but like for me, I had to learn all these like customs or, you know, what have you that my mom didn't know about. Yeah. So, you know, it's like that thing where I always say like Thanksgiving is a very American holiday. And I had to explain to my mom that Thanksgiving, and like, you know, my siblings did too, but like she couldn't understand like, why are we celebrating? Why are we giving thanks on a day where people like me didn't win? <laughs> you know what I mean? She's like, she's like, uh, look at me. I look like Native, like yeah. I'm Native American. You know, she's like, uh, why are we celebrating that uh, I'm not a thing? You know what I mean? And it's like, and the, you're also navigating that narrative, right? Because you're yeah. just like, okay, I'm not the majority or of what I see in textbooks right. and all these things and what my family looks like. That's not what I'm seeing on TV. Ex and, and, and it's weird because then like when I, when I try to, ex when I was trying to explain to my mom certain things, she would have all these questions because it seems so foreign to her. She's like, but why? And why? Pero por qué? But, but, por qué? And, what? and then after a while, I'm like, Dude, I'm in second grade. I don't know why. Like, I just learned this. Like, yo, like, give me a couple years. Like, I, I was just telling you what I learned. Like, I just learned how to write cursive. Like, take it down a notch. They're not know? telling us why either. My, <laughs> my, the guy sitting next to me still eats glue. Like, give me a minute, man. Like, you know, it's weird. And there's all this translating that we have to do. Like, I know you talk yes. about a lot of translating, government. I, yes. I know my mom's social security better than I know my own because I pretended to be her for so Oh, I, I used to forge my mom's signature on the report card my mom never saw them like she would just she would just like she's you know and I would my mom had a second grade education so she didn't write very well so when I forged her signature it always had to look bad because mm. if it looked good then they knew that I had done it mm. so I would have to like write it like she did you know and but yeah yeah it's like the, it's weird because I even mentioned in the book it's like a lot of kids I realized that not everybody translated for their parents so like a lot of kids in school they would talk about their problems and they're like, oh, and so-and-so, and maybe, like, I want that Cabbage Patch doll, and blah, blah, blah. And me, I'm like, like, you think that's rough? Like, I had to make sure that my mom took her blood pressure pill this morning, and I don't even know if she took it or not. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? And you're, trans you're translating medication and stuff, and you don't even know what the medication is. And news. Like, yeah, you know, you're like, ah, I hope I don't kill her. Like, you know what I mean? It, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. And, you're, and at the same time, you're figuring out your own life. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. What do I do? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm translating and I'm just like, oh, and I love the new kids on the block. I'm like, they're like looking at the new kids on the block. And I'm like, no, mom. Well, see, the government says that welfare, and like, you know, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. But and OK. And now that now that we're talking about how we uh, we we our first generation experiences, I want to talk about Cristela, which I, it was a semi autobiographical 
autobiographical yes. sitcom. And it kind of spoke to that dynamic, right? Of kind yes. of living between those two spaces, you know, the American space yes. and the like home space with your family. Um, it was canceled in 2015 yes. after one season. 22 episodes, yes. 22 episodes. And we, and you know, it's something that we're starting to see a lot, unfortunately, one day at a time after mm-hmm. three seasons canceled this year. Even but with, let me say, three seasons is a good run. No, three seasons is like, good. I mean, if people made it, made it seem like, I, look, one day at a time is a great show. But at the same time, it's like, that's two more years than I had. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh. Like, you know, I'm like, I mean, that's, it's a good show, but I'm like, I would have loved to have gotten a three 100%. seasons. hundred percent. But I think, it's, I think it speaks to also this question of like, both cited low viewership or low ratings. Yeah, of course. And it's, and it's one of those things, like, we see other other shows that are low ratings that continue on for many seasons. Yes. Um, so the question is here, and one of the things that I hear a lot about is, like, you know, networks aren't giving the promotion they deserve to, right. the, to these shows or the right promotion or the right marketing or they're trying to market to Latinos in the wrong way. So what is what is it like from someone who has lived it like what is it that we have to do here to fix this issue of prematurely ending shows with followings well okay so here's a perfect example which i actually learned so i've learned a lot because with my show i was in the writer's room i created the show everything so i was in all the meetings that most actors don't get to be in Mm -hmm. so when you start talking to the marketing department you realize that um you're pretty much set to fail from the beginning. Hmm. Now, uh, a year, the year after my show was canceled, I was doing a, a panel here at the Ford Foundation in New York with uh, Jeff Yang, whose uh, kid Hudson is in uh, Fresh Off the Boat. Now, both of those shows started the same year, Christella and Fresh Off the Boat. And uh, he started talking about how wonderful the experience was. We had the same studio, it was Fox, 20th Century Fox, and then ABC as a network. So we were both, same people. Comedy department, same people. So I'm sitting at this panel, and I realize that his difference, his experience is different from mine, completely. Supportive from like get-go everything. Then I noticed it was at that moment after my show had been canceled, that moment sitting there next to Jeff Yang, that I learned that the head of casting and the head of comedy were both Asian women. So they were very supportive of Fresh Off the Boat because they knew what the show was trying to do. Mm -hmm. So they had a chance to actually tell stories because part of the higher ups, which I like to call like the decision makers, the gatekeepers, they knew what the stories were and it seemed familiar to them. My, in my situation, there were no Latinos, no Latinx, no anything. So I had to constantly explain my life and be told that my life wasn't my life, that it wasn't accurate. Um, I use this example all the time. I loved Roseanne, like the original show coming up. Loved it, used to watch it all the time. I watched it because it reminded me of my family. But I also realized that that was Roseanne's way of being a mom. Mm -hmm. You never watch Roseanne and think, man, every white mom has has to be like Roseanne. She's representing all white mothers. Now, why is it that Latino programming has to do that? We always have to represent everybody. Like, we can't just be uh, a brown-skinned mother or like, you know, it's like even telling people that Latinos can be of different shades of skin, you know, that we can have, you know, white skin, you know, it's like, it's so mind-blowing to them because in their perception, they have this idea of what your life should be like, your expectations should be like, you know. So it was a lot of fighting. Mm-hmm. from the get-go and for me my whole thing was this might be the only thing I ever do with my life so I'm gonna fight and there were times even before the show started where I threatened to walk away because I'm like I don't want to even try this if if it's not gonna be real to my truth because now I'm just selling you like now I'm selling my soul so let's say that I do it your version and it's not my life and then it gets canceled anyway well I don't know if I can if they canceled it because I wasn't honest about myself and did you or if I was, you know, if they canceled it because of my life and, you know, whatever it was based on, you know. I wanted it to be judged by merit. And I think I talk about it in the book. Like, Spanish is my first language. And they found out I spoke Spanish. And that was game over. 
they wanted me to do Spanish interviews, all Spanish media. They, you know, it was more Spanish than English because they thought that that's how you get Latinos to watch your show mm -hmm. because we all speak Spanish. Of course. You know what I mean? So Every it's like we one. all speak Spanish. We all do everything, you know. So and this is 2014. So it's not that long ago. You know, so it's this thing where, you know, for me, it was really interesting how I thought, oh, uh, I'm one of the first ones. I'm the first Latina to do all of it, you know, to act, write, produce, and everything in it. So I'm getting to see behind the door on different avenues in a weird, different way. So it was a lot of fighting where, you know, even I talk about it in the book, their marketing plan was um, we didn't get a billboard. My show never got a billboard. But they have billboards for everything. I, I didn't get a billboard. But at the marketing meeting, the network said, hey, we have this great idea. You're going to love it. Talking bus benches. We're going to do talking bus benches. We'll place them in Latino neighborhoods. And they're going to have your face. And it's going to have Cristela, like, starting to Friday, da, 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 da. We're going to make them talking bus benches. So how about this? So they sit on your face. You know, while they wait for the bus. And when they sit on the bus bench, you talk to them. And you're like, hey, guys, this is Cristal Alonso. I have a new show starting, da 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 da, da. And I, the first thing I said, is it in English or Spanish? And they didn't have an answer. And I'm like, so it was Spanish? You know what I mean? Yeah. And right there, I'm like, oh, I will absolutely not let you do that. I will so not let you do that because it's so offensive to my community. And by the way, why is it that we always assume that like all Latinos speak Spanish and we only watch Spanish TV? And I'm like, my show's in English. Mm -hmm. You guys know my show's in English. I'm like, you got, you're putting it on. It's in English, you know. And they're like, oh, but the, you know, it's gonna work. And I was seen as difficult. Mm -hmm. That's when I started getting labeled as difficult because I didn't accept my talking bus benches. So instead of the talking bus benches, I got nothing. And in a way, it's almost like, did, did I? Did I get punished for not wanting the talking bus benches? I don't know, but that's what happened, you know? And for me, I went through a lot of crap that I stayed quiet about for so long because I was afraid that the next Latino or Latina wouldn't get the chance because I ruined it for them. Mm -hmm. Because it's so hard for us to get a chance. Yeah. You start that, tokenizing yourself. That, that, you know, <laughs> so for me, you know, I say this all the time. When you're one of the first or not the first person to do something, you're building the house while you're drawing up the blueprints. You know, and I remember there were times when we were shooting the show, I realized, like, my show didn't have a chance. It, we weren't. The people weren't ready to really promote it as a regular show. And I remember uh, my friend Steve, who's here with me, we would talk about it a lot while the show was on. And we would talk a lot about, like, halfway through the year, I told him, this show's not going to go. But I feel like this show will open the door for the next show to succeed. Mm -hmm. Thinking like that halfway through the year of your own show is so heartbreaking because you realize that there's just nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. That you just write it out and hope for the best. And then, you know, the next year, one day at a time came out and people paid attention to it, you know? And it was that thing where, you know, I'm like, I thought the show was great, and well, I mean, it still is great because it's still going, it's still you know? Going, yeah. But it was this thing where only now, in 2019, am I comfortable in talking about the crap that I went through because it's now I'm at the point where now I need to, now I need to use it as a warning sign to other people. Yeah. When people ask me advice or like just opinions, I will tell them the flat out truth because that's how we help each other. We need to talk about, we need to talk about real stuff. We need to talk, we need to talk about the power we have. And in this business, sometimes the power we have is to say no. Mm -hmm. That's all we got, you know? And for me, I'm like, that's why people ask me, 
when are you coming back to TV? When are you going to do another show? When are you going to do... I'm like, I, I have nothing to say right now. I, I don't want to do it for money. I really love doing this for a living. Like, my mom went through a lot of crap so that I could have this chance. And I love doing it because I just... I love what I do. And I only want to tell stories that matter to me. And ones that feel true to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Regardless. And they don't have to be autobiographical, but they got to yeah. resonate with me. They got to make me want to do it. And because of that, I just, I haven't even tried. I yeah. just, I just haven't had anything speak to me. Yeah. And I do want to give a chance for uh, some of our audience members to, to ask some questions. We have two. And the first question. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if when you were writing the book, if you looked for advice from family since they were so integral in like the story. You know what's funny is that I actually uh, I actually didn't talk to my family about specific stuff because <laughs> I wanted to give my version of it. Because okay. then like when people give you their stories, then you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. And it's funny because to me, I thought I didn't want too much history because it wasn't my family's book. It was my book. So, you know, it's like when my brothers and my sister, which haven't read it, will read it. I want to make sure that like I told my truth and I'm like, you know, I... I didn't ask you because you weren't there, right? So no, like, like <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what they think of it. Uh, Surprise! Hey, yeah. And we have another question. Hi. So you talked about there being a lot of lows in your book. I was just wondering if there was anything that was like too painful that you were either like hesitant or like really didn't want to add. Uh, yes, that's a great question. I actually uh, cut. I cut so many pages from the chapter about my show because uh, I wasn't ready to talk about uh, things that happened. There's a, a chat, you know, a part in the chapter where I talk about getting harassed yeah. at the network up front where uh, some TV executives started making comments about my boobs and uh, started getting handsy with me. And as I was writing it, I found myself stopping a lot and I wrote it. And it was so triggering for me that I, I had to delete it because I was afraid that it would actually have the same reaction to other people. Okay. I was so like vulnerable that I didn't want to talk about it. And also, I didn't want to talk this is an interesting one. I had so many problems with, um, with the writing in my show because uh, my voice, the show was named after me, but I wasn't seen as the most important voice in the writer's room. And I didn't go into detail because then I didn't want to give them, I say um, good and bad people help shape who you become and they will always be a part of you. But when you give them too much real estate in your mind, it's just not worth it because then you realize that they had an effect on you that uh, for me, I don't think they're important enough for the world to know how bad they were. So I refuse to have them exist in print but I'll talk about it in person. <laughs> you know? That's what we're here for. <laughs> and that's what we're here for. Well, thank you so much, Cristela, Cristela Alonso. Music to My Years, a mixtape memoir of growing up and standing up, comes out tomorrow, October 8th, which is also the day you kick off your stand-up tour. Yes! It's going to double as a book signing tour. Yes! That's called My Affordable Care Act 2019 tour. My Affordable Care <laughs> Act! I call it My Affordable Care Act because like, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a stand-up show and a book signing. So I was like, look, and I don't charge for the meet and greet or anything or the sign. It's just like, so I'm like, it's My Affordable Care Act. Let's like how we take care of ourselves. It's, yeah, I just I love the I love the name of it. Like I, I love the name of it. Like, I'm it obsessed. Well, and congratulations again, and thank you so much for being here. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you.